Thank you for joining us, everyone. Um, I am Brielle, I'm a renting artist at McGuffey Art Center. We are so excited to be able to share these artist talks with you all through McGuffey, one of the oldest artist run cooperatives in the country, which is located in a historic elementary school building in downtown Charlottesville. The Art Center is a community of artists dedicated to practicing art and passing on the creative spirit to the greater community of Charlottesville through increasing access to art opportunities for all. We are super happy to have you here today for artist for our artist talk with Hannah Toppenberger. Hannah, Hannah is a multidisciplinary artist who recently completed a short residency at McGuffey Art Center for the months of September and October of last year. We at McGuffey Art Center started a residency program in early 2021 to offer free limited time physical space to artists and writers in the community to work on proposed, proposed projects. Artists are able to pitch a use for the studio space and work on starting or finishing a body of work. This program was built out of the need to support our local artist community during COVID-19 and to create opportunities for artists to be connected to a physical community of artists while also building their portfolio of work. We're currently lining up our artists through summer of 2022 and we hope that this program continues into the future. Hi everyone, I'm also gonna be helping with moderating today. I'm Sri, another renting artist here at McGuffey Art Center. Um, before we hand it over to Hannah to start her introduction, I wanna quickly go over some Zoom etiquette for this session, which is just to be mindful of being muted during this talk. The mute button's on the bottom left, as everybody knows, We've been on Zoom for two years now, almost. Um, this session is being recorded and we're gonna make it available for viewing on the McGuffey website as well as McGuffey's YouTube channel. But if you don't want your face to be recorded, uh, you can turn off your video using the bottom, the bottom left button. If you have any questions or comments you wanna share or interact with other folks here today, you can use the chat function to type in questions. We're gonna keep an eye on the chat box throughout um, the next hour, and we'll bring up any relevant questions for Hannah, but we'll also have a separate Q&A section at the very end. And I just want to say thank you all for joining us, and I'll get started by doing a quick introduction of Hannah through her artist bio, and then I'll pass the mic over to her. Hannah Taubenberger is a multidisciplinary artist from Charlottesville, Virginia. She's based in both Richmond and Charlottesville. She received her BFA in Sculpture and Extended Media from Virginia Commonwealth University in 2020 with a concentration in Italian studies and video. Her work primarily focuses on sculpture and installation. Inspired by the influences of time perception and its relationship to age, as well as the meaning of true sanctuary and stability in times of mass grief, Hannah utilizes these notions to create heavily atmospheric work. Her work is mostly sculpture-based, sculpture but oftentimes accompanied by poetry, video, sound, and performance. Common symbols in her work include candles, elements of time, bricks, flowers, and home-related objects. We're really excited to have her here today. I'm, I'm gonna pass it over to her to share her screen for a slideshow presentation that she's got, as well as a little introduction about herself. Hi, welcome and thanks for coming. Thanks for the lovely introduction, by the way, it was really lovely. Okay, I'm going to share the screen. Um, and okay, screen share. Awesome. Can everybody see? Okay. Still coming up. Excellent. So my name is Hannah. I grew up in Charlottesville. Um, and I typically work with sculpture based work um, and most of my work tends to be related to loose pigments. Um, the ornating things and um, ornamenting them and so. Um, a lot of my work is accompanied by a set of poems so it's compartmentalized. Um, and then I have sound and performance as well. So I like to have these different mediums that sort of come into relation with each other and they tend to have um, some fluidity to them. And so um, that's normally what my work is, but um, it's oftentimes based around the home and home related objects, um, a relation of femininity. Um, and then time perception and loss grief. Um, and so those are the things that I typically work with. Thank you for the intro. 
It's perfect. Um, let's see. Can we? Sh let's get this into slideshow mode. Okay. Um, sure. That might be. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Excellent. All righty. Um, thank you so much for sharing about your work and giving us a little intro on you and what you do. Um, so knowing that you have this amazing slideshow you put together for us today, um, we're going to do our best to come up with some questions or to support the slideshow with some questions that are relevant and um, they, they play nicely together, hopefully. So um, first of all, can you go a little further into the themes and concepts that you like to explore in your work? So um, typically I work with duality and a contrast, a contrast or juxtaposition within work. And I so, so typically I like to have these themes that are contrasting or things that are fluid in nature um, where they, it's hard to define like where they meet in the middle um, and how they're ever expanding. And so some of the themes that I work with are toxicity versus sanctuary um, and the idea of leaning towards something and then the process of getting there is incredibly toxic and so it's justifying the ends with the means. Um, verticality of wallpaper in the home and creating an environment using wallpaper um, and something that is plastered on and creates this opulence of wealth but is actually just cheap paper and so discussion of wealth and um, its relation to worth in the home um, at time related objects like flowers and candles things that'll um, that'll decompose or show a lapse of time um, toxicity of luxury items and things that bring comfort to oneself um, precarious generations which um, are generations that lose stability and have mass grief um, due to the context of what is surrounding those generations and the time period that they grow up in with the cultural um, factors and then generational knowledge and the gap of things that um, becomes more funneled over time. Uh, fragility of mental health, especially in relation to precarious generations, um, what it means to mirror an object um, and the idea of ink blots and um, the idea of ink blots in relation to mental health um, and then mass grief and loss. Thank you so much for sharing about that. It's so fascinating. I'm sure we'll, we'll get to hear more about the themes when you kind of go further into what you've been creating. Uh, I am curious why, why you're drawn to the materials you're drawn to and um, what you use regularly. Um, so typically I use um, materials that are from different um, brackets of wealth. And so I have resin, wallpaper, um, the idea of facade, um, typically things that are toxic um, or volatile like marzipan matches smoke, which I create within environments, heated environments, um, metal or wo wooden legs, um, bricks, flowers in various stages of decomposition, candles in different stages of um, being used gold leaf foil, chocolate boxes that are deconstructed and brought across oceans, fruit, nuts, um, glue, wax, and then um, various pigments and powders, um, spices, berries, glitter, jewels, and charms, and something that have a nostalgic factor and quality to them. Um, and typically, I relate things back to the notion of the Victorian era um, and the idea of the middle class and what a sanctuary is um, or what a safe home is. And so typically I use elements of toxicity and the idea of trying to obtain a sanctuary or a place that's incredibly safe. Um, and then the process of getting there is the toxic part of it. And then also the duality of the process um, and the materials are incredibly toxic. And so I typically work with things like that. I love how cohesive your materials and your concepts and themes are all together. They support each other so beautifully. It's such an amazing little web you have um, with your work. Like it's its, its own world. It's amazing. Um, so 
talking with you as someone who has been an artist in residence at McGuffey, I'm super eager to get into what you um, made while you were in the studio or what you were working on in the studio. Um, so can you start to tell us about that a little bit? Yeah, so when I was in the residence, I had um, different sort of things that I worked on. I worked on poems um, and I worked on these tables. I had a set of different tables that I worked on. Um, during that time, I also traveled to Germany. So that sort of relates back to the poetry and making of poetry. Um, and so I wanted to go over the wallpaper and the impact of um, the Schiel's Green or Schloss Green, which was invented by um, Schiel, who was this Swedish German art um, chemist. And so he typically had um, this really toxic material and it was really revolutionary at the time. But so it was something that one surrounded themselves in the home, stuff that they would wear um, and it was used in everything. And so the idea of like something trendy and safe was this really toxic thing. And so it was used in the home and clothes and it really was indiscriminate against who it affected because the women and the children that were making the fabrics were affected and killed off because of the toxicity of the arsenic inside. Um, and then also the women that wore it and the people that um, could now afford to have the wallpaper were affected. And so there's this idea of um, a lost generation in a way of lost potential of uh, development and people who lost their lives. And it was um, reflected in newspapers. And so um, William Morris actually, um, so his, his dad um, owned the mines. And so he would use the arsenic from that to save money. And so there's this idea of consumerism, but also during this time with the rise of the middle class, there was this um, rise of using uh, advertisements in newspapers. And so this is actually um, a reference to one of the newspaper articles that was written and the advertisements against this. And so these were the effects of, of the, um, accumulation of it over time in your bloodstream. And so right now um, there's the blisters, the genitalia, there's jaundice in the eyes, and also the yellowness in the fingers, blisters, um, this herpy-like quality, and then um, this rotting flesh. And so it's a little bit graphic, but um, it's really interesting that um, it sort of like affected people over time. And there's this, this lost generation like lost potential of people. Wow. So you were you were diving deep into some of these toxic materials and this is incredible. You're teaching me a lot. <laughs> um so did this when did this inform the um the work you were doing while you were in the residency mm -hmm. pretty directly? So it informed the materials in the process of making. Um, and so I had these different elements, which were rather affordable of um, explore, exploring those ideas. And so um, this was the table that was made, the second one, and there are different stages of decomposition and different stages of elements of time and candles being used in different forms. And um, so this is actually the first piece that I did within McGuffey. And so in McGuffey, I typically worked with sculpture and poetry, but so for this piece, it was done um, and sort of, it, it was used um, in a way that was sort of mirrored and um, was, installed and accumulated over time. And this was the first piece. Did I hear you? Did yeah. you have writing associated with this piece? Yes. So oh. I had a poem um, for this. And so I accompanied it. Um, and so uh, it's called Waltz of the Ants. A singular brick forgotten, discredited, protruded, penetrated, intruded into the orange sun rays. Ants enter, lining the border, mystified by the tunnels they endure and create. 
navigate, alert, twist inside of sweet candy core, sweets on the inside, hardened hearts on the outside, grass elongating the width, nature overcoming the man-made craft of irregularity now becoming the prey, taking away the material piece by piece, tunnel by tunnel, an orange Halloween, a strange waltz into the orange saffron surface. The waltz of the ants, insiders trading the candied fruits and nuts, a nest for feeding, and feeding they receive, a savoring ceremony of interconnecting tunnels and movements. As time goes on, elongates, the brick is slowly eaten away, adultered food, a hard orange parasite from India. Mica powder, adultering their candies, an unwanted brick shell, brick-shaped, a sharpened wrapper vessel, slowly being eaten away, whittled away material, chipped away until there is no more, a waltz of madness into the alluring and so tangent saffron. This is the waltz of the ants. Thank you for sharing. This yeah. is the first of your writing I've heard. I am um, actually during this process of making, I saw these ants create this piece of sanctuary and um, the man-made forms that I made. And I found it so visually interesting that they had this pattern and this array of movement and they were so specific about where they whittled in the material. And it was just really beautiful for them to create this home. And so I have the bricks outside currently, but it's just really beautiful that they <laughs> created a home within something that was related to sanctuary. Yeah. That's really, really neat. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, yeah, I second Bria. I didn't actually, I'd, I'd read your poem, but I hadn't, it's very different when someone else reads it out loud with your own um, intonation. And I wanted to ask a little bit about that first piece again. Would you be able to go back one slide so that we could look at yeah. it one more time? Mm -hmm. Is it something, so can you recreate this mold? again and again, and would you recreate it? So for this, I specifically took the brick from my home, some leftover bricks. And so the bricks are individual, um, and I'm not sure what the brand is and how old it is, but um, recreating a similar brick um, would make sense. It's just that this one's very site specific, um, and it's specific to the physical place that it's from. Yeah, I love that. I love that that connection to place and the, the, that attachment to this. This kind of exists only temporally in this moment. Mm -hmm. Would you tell us a little bit about the next piece that kind of evolved yeah. after this one? Mm -hmm. So Shields Table was the first table I worked on during um, the residency. And so it, it had these um, different I, I created this environment um, in the process of making where it had these smoke strands and it had heat and flammable materials so that it could create the smoke and the fire inside the table while it was curing. So um, for those who don't know, um, during the curing process, resin doesn't, um, as it doesn't dry, it cures. So what happens is um, it'll heat up over time and it'll dry itself out from the inside. And so during this process, um, I had little fires, like really, really tiny ones that would occur within the table. And I used um, things like the candles matches, very uh, like a really dry environment um, powder. And then I had the wallpaper, which is really flammable. And so I created these like mini fires within um, sculpting of tweezers while the resin was curing um, in the environments that I made. And so um, for this, I was thinking a lot about verticality um, and just the home in general and recreating this table, which is very functional in nature, but also is um, sort of this representation of wallpaper and uh, toxicity. And this was the process of making. So I created this environment um, within the mold and then I had things that sort of went on top but um, it had all these different sort of Y2K in nature charms to it, um, which sort of like <laughs> went inside. Um, it was really laborious, it's really heavy. Um, but so I sort of had to do it outside because there is this element of toxicity to the process of making and it kind of like ties back in with the general core and concept. Um, and so these are images of like 
the process of making this huge table and the washing it and scraping at it and lifting it and doing all of these things to create it. And yeah, it had all these different elements that sort of tied in. That's really beautiful. I, I really, really love the colors too. Was there a choice in the colors that you selected for this? Um, so for the matches, I had sort of green and a neutral color. And then for the wallpaper, it sort of, well, it, it um, the arsenic was banned in 1985, thank God. Um, so it's not as toxic. Um, but so it has, um, it sort of mimics the arsenic and the William Morris wallpaper of the 19th century. And it has um, these particular mimicking uh, languages that happen within it um, with the mirroring, but then also with the type of format for the wallpaper. Um, and then I had these different like adulterated foods inside and um, like the, so the foods would become sort of unsafe with um, the chemicals that they were sort of mixed in and incorporated with. So there's like this process of adulterating food, which is something that the Victorians used to do. Um, they used to put like plaster and bread and um, they had all these ideas of what beautiful food is, but then they were sort of toxic. And so there's just like this idea of sanctuary and toxicity and luxury products and toxicity that always sort of coincide. Um, but so, that's typically um, what would happen. So that's like what happened with this table. Um, and it had all these different elements. And I was thinking about mirroring too and the ink blots and the idea of having mental health with ink blots and um, just the history with that. And it's, it's really interesting because we actually don't even know how to use ink blots, but we still use them. And I thought it would be interesting to have that sort of motif um, but have it be sort of like, you know, more deconstructed or abstract. So I, I made these ink blots of the table. Yeah, I love that. That's actually the, the, one of the first things that I saw, especially in the images that you have up right now was it reminded me of the ink blot tests. And I, that the, especially with the reflection of what is probably just sunlight across like the glitter or like that surface kind of adds to the mirroring or enhances the different layers that are within it. Yeah, definitely. Um, I was also curious, does, um, is this something that you would also potentially keep outside like the, like the ceramic brick that you'd created in the first piece or is this something that's more of like an indoor installation? Um, so for the bricks, I left them in the snow in order to uh, document them. And then as it got warmer, the ants sort of took over. And I just thought that it was, you know, a beautiful process. And they deserved it after all of the work that they did to penetrate the bricks. Um, but for this piece, I documented it inside. And then um, it just sort of makes sense for bricks to be outside and playing with the inside and outside of things. And tables just um, make more sense functionally when they're indoors, um, typically. So I, I had no intention of leaving it out or documenting it outside. That's completely fair. It's beautiful. So I, I would, can also understand keeping it indoors. Yeah, totally. Would you, I know that there's also a poem that goes along with this one. Would you read that one for us too? Yeah, of course. Um, this one is called The Mobility of Ivy. She's corroding inside in a boat that was once hers, that is still hers, that will never be hers. It's a house with fully grown and green old money on the outside. It's seeping in ready to engage, ready to enable, engage, and strangle. You would be enraged by its actions, but that's its nature. There's no stopping it now. It is minimizing her mobility by growing into the crevices and bolts of the door, creating mobility, for itself simultaneously. She struggles on the inside. Her walker has become a secondhand wheelchair, her mobility fading and fading. It's always been on the outside. She was once too, once moving like it does. As she ages, it does. As she declines, it thrives. Um, entangling the body and structure, her gout grows, growing pains on the inside. Her fading decline in her late husband's once, once touched upon house, adultered by him. It's now altered by the ivy. 
that he once groomed and controlled. Now there's no control. The man made the new, the structure, the decline, the old, the portal, the mobility, the process of decline, a slow goodbye. A man was ordered to once again groom it, one last order of control. It's out, faded by gravity. It, it fell in bunches and clumps and now surrounds the abode. The home is now on the inside, not the outside. It surrounds her home. Like salt, a protective Wiccan barrier, now to decompose in synchronicity with her once again, once more. On the outside, it fades. On the inside, she fades. Once it grew with her on the outside and her on the inside, flourishing, now they both wither. And so that's the poem that is uh, accompanied with it. Thank you so much for sharing that. That was, that's amazing. I love how your work affects the way that we interpret the visual work so much as well like your written poems that go with them they change how I look at the visual work that you've created um will you tell us a little bit more about your relationship with writing sort of when how long that's been a part of your creative practice and like what how much it kind of contributes to your feeling like I don't know a piece is whole or, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm just, I'm just curious off about your relationship with it. And um, so, typically, I write stuff to accompany it. It used to be, um, I used to do sound performance and video that would accompany work, but I found that the writing was much more powerful to have um, paired with work. Typically, so. Um, when I typically make a piece of work, um, if it's mostly sculptural or installation or performance space, I really like to have um, my thoughts sort of captured within it um, so that there's this different type of language that can accompany a piece of work. And um, I, I find that language, even though it's, it's so imperfect, um, sometimes it really captures the thoughts really well um, when a piece fails to do so or if it's lacking, um, if it has like a blind spot conceptually, it's really nice to have the thoughts that I have with it. Absolutely. I hear that. Um, I had a, this is kind of maybe a silly question, but I just was curious while you were talking about the table piece, um, how you sort of envision these inhabiting space, like, are you, the bricks, the brick I can, I, you've already talked about and I feel, I feel like I grasp that really well, but with the tables, I'm just curious when you're making furniture that could be potentially something that was like used in a household, is that something that you think about as maybe being part of the life of the piece or is, or do you see the piece sort of standing aside more as a, like a traditional sculpture in a, in a home or, or space? Um. I typically see it as something that'll be used. Um, I, I also envision the pieces in a gallery space or an institution, but I feel like just as functional objects, they can exist um, without the performance of the art world or they can exist within it. Um, and so I, I have this very flexible intention of making uh, where something can be acquired by other people and used by them or not used. Um, and I feel rather flexible about how that object will exist in the universe. I think because you're making work about home and like sanctuary and everything, but it's also work that could be used in a home. That's just such an interesting like relationship that you're, the work you make could have with its eventual space that it like ends up living in. It's such a neat thing to think about, but let's see. Okay, get back to, get back to our planned questions. <laughs> um, let's see, so are there, yeah, I wanna hear about your trip to Germany that you mentioned early on in your intro and sort of what that did for you while you were there artistically, creatively, but also just in spirit. And then um, maybe how that might've influenced work after that or 
whatever you want to expand on in that sense. Yeah, so I went to Heilbronn, um, I went to Germany, um, and Heilbronn is a place where my family has existed for many generations, and I wanted to feel this spiritual connection to my family's grave and uh, just the heritage um, that I was sort of missing out on um, from a spatial standpoint. And so I visited these graves um, and I just noticed one thing off the bat was that the way that my grandmother would garden and compartmentalize things was exactly the way that they were using in this very, very old graveyard. And it was so interesting. I um, sat down in the graveyard and I wrote a poem at the time about just the gardening aspects um, and aesthetics of it and how there was, there were these specific animals that would go to specific graves and then each grave was um, compartmentalized and it had these, um, it had organisms and flowers and statues and all of these things which would be pruned by animals and tended to. And so every single family had a different type of, I, I guess I would say energy. Um, and so they had different aesthetics to sort of be tailored to those energies. And um, so I, I thought it was just really interesting that there were these animals that um, they sort of congregated in specific graves because the specific flowers were chosen for this specific family. And then they go around. Um, so for us, we had the snails and we had the birds and then we had spiders. And so those were the animals that congregated for my family. And um, it was just this very quiet moment. So I feel like if you were just passing by, you wouldn't notice the different systems of animals at play. Um, and there were these, um, so typically there would be animals that would go to specific ones, but then there were also animals that would go to all the graves. So it was um, really interesting to see like systems within systems. And um, so this was the uh, florist that I went to. It was closed, but it smelled exactly like um, like my grandmother's house. And it was just really interesting because um, smell is something that triggers memories more than any other scent. So it was just this really powerful notion to smell the flowers and the gardening aesthetics. And it was exactly like, you know, across the world, like in my grandmother's house and garden. And that was just so powerful. Um, and so I thought it was really interesting because there is such intention within making and gardening. And um, it, it was just something that I wasn't even thinking about. So to see all of these different gardening aesthetics and techniques be used to create this, um, sort of like interacting environment was just so beautiful. And I wrote a, um, these are the different graves, but I wrote a poem that sort of accompanies um, this idea. And so it's called Spiritual Circadian Rhythms. Um, relics given, candles lit, prayers spoken, Earl Grey spilled, shadows hidden, materials manifested. I felt my body become overtaken, fully actualized in some form. It's as if my body began to sink into a new rhythm, a spiritual form of my circadian rhythms, internal systems, a spiritual and natural reset. The compacted dirt is customized and compartmentalized into rows, and in each row are sections, flocks of many people. Many remain compacted, a uh, shared communal grave blocks. And in each block, each shared family is pruned and tended to um, by the shared gardening blocks and heritage of a symbolic gardener, florist family. His movement and art in its own right, tended to in care, his work um, also classifiably on its deathbed. In the site-specific grave, the outside world tries to peek in, but, but is unable to. This is the same with the sun, making attempts to penetrate the thick oak trees that provide 
nurturing shade for those who remain below. Each family is a, speci a speciality, customized and cared for each morning. Each grave has their own designated flowers, statues, candles, notes, and naturally occurring animals who remain in orbit to certain plant systems, orbiting energy and celestial animals um, and plants in some form. Some animals remain in isolated blocks of graves individual systems, others grave hop, interacting with the entire system itself. Uh, these gardening techniques were abandoned, the quaint isolated nature left behind. Once I left my body, lost its natural synchronicity, it never knew it was missing. Generational healing and knowledge abandoned once more. The amoeba bubble of Heilbronn, spiritually bombed and forgotten for a new home. Until next time, until we reunite again and you absorb me once more. Until then, sweet Heilbronn, my body may have forgotten you, but my mind has yet to. Thank so you beautiful. so much. Yeah, for sharing that. That's so beautiful. Thank you. The intimacy of that piece is like, we. I mean, I don't know. I wasn't even there, but I think you really captured um, yeah, just that love of that longing for ancestry. And I don't know, it's, it, that was really beautiful. Thank you. Um, yeah, we'd love for you to talk about that, um, Cinnabar, that last piece that you'd created during your time in the space. So the last piece that I created, um, was a different pigment from the rest of them. And so I decided to up the dramatics in scale and also in just different visual forms. And so cinnabar was used with the chocolate boxes and the marzipan that I bought specifically in Germany. So there was a difference in the, spe the site specificity of the materials that were used in the process of making. And so I created this black sort of um, glue that was mixed with like silicone and a few other things. And so I um, made these isolated bodies of toxicity um, and I put them in this sort of arrangement. Um, and so it had these different uh, berries and it had marzipan and it had, um, like the danger cautionary tape and it had gems and pearls and just really ornate things. And it um, was relating to pigments and toxicity, but also I was thinking about traveling when I was traveling and the different pigments that are used in different places. Um, and so this one was sort of um, inspired by um, trying to find it, the Red Queen. Um, and so there was just this really beautiful um, idea of femininity and um, toxicity and the idea of um, this mystery queen um, sort of using like this red alluring toxic um, material cinnabar to create, um, to put over her and adorn her in her death. And if anyone was to disturb her ancestral home um, in her ancestral burial place, they would die from the cinnabar. Um, and I thought that there was just this really powerful sort of femme fatale idea that sort of ties into it. Um, and I thought that it was just really powerful to have like this beautiful, brave um, sort of overpower a space and sort of adorn her um, after, after death. And, I thought that it would be really interesting to sort of um, create something that was similar. Um, and so I have the pigments that are surrounded by these profile pictures from chocolate boxes and um, they sort of create like this really intense um, sort of visual aspect. Um, and it's just really, it's similar, but it's not the same. Um, but so I really like the idea of global pigments and the pigments that are used around the world. And um, just the idea of like 
the process of laying the pigment down and um, having it be like this exposed thing was just really interesting to me. That's so neat. I really, really love, I love the, um, the inspiration that you drew from the Red Queen. I just love the, the concept, but then also just looking at visually, it's so striking. Um, are there any, I see also that there are berries that you've included in it, aside from the, um, the marzipan and box chocolates that you got from Germany, are there, what are the photos that are in it? Um, so the photos are from the chocolate boxes that I deconstructed. And so um, after I brought them back and consumed them, I decided that they have this really interesting quality that's very similar to wallpaper. And it has this sort of um, fake ornateness to it. Um, and like this sort of fake opulence to create like the idea of wealth and, and beauty. Um, and so I thought it'd be really interesting to sort of like tamper with them, um, deconstruct them and put them into this toxic sort of um, form. And uh, yeah, it was just, um, it was really interesting to sort of mimic them and have them change and become like this new thing. Um, and the idea of like profiles next to um, toxins and toxic uh, particles, um, I thought was really visually striking. I really love that, um, the, that the materials also informed the process too. That you kind of went in with, with an inspiration, but then also found more materials to kind of add in. And I love this happenstance of being like, oh, I didn't, the having the, um, the conjunction of this ornateness of the, the chocolate boxes to put in is just like this exciting found object that becomes now like very integral to the meaning of the work. That's really fascinating. Yeah, thank you so much. I wanna say too that um, when we first opened up on this piece, the slide, you mentioned immediately, like this is a very different color palette. And it was funny because before you went into the meeting, the meaning behind the piece and your inspirations into it, I immediately thought of the flowers in Germany and like the, the brilliance of the colors of the graves and stuff. And I was thinking like, it took me right back because you had just shown us photos of the graves. Um, and I wonder if that was maybe also somehow in the back of your mind, this, this desire to make something bright because you'd just been around all these beautiful ancestral kind of meaningful plants and but I don't know yeah <laughs> it's, it, it no it, it's definitely a really um intense observation just because um all of the materials sort of have this fake opulence and idea of comfort um and even like it's so weird, like marzipan isn't fruit, but it's like this weird paste that this almond extract that you put with sugar and then you mold it in. It's so gross. You like mold it into the fruit to mimic the fruit, but it's not fruit. And like the, it's gold paint, not like actual gold paper of the chocolate boxes and wallpaper isn't like marble, it, it's just paper. And so there's like this whole idea of facade within um, these objects and they yeah. all sort of like have that weird element to it. I'm really fascinated by, or I, I really love that you are so tied to this sort of sense of color and place and the relationships between color and place because, and this idea of like pigment and history and um, I don't know, it's something that I know Sri and I both think about a lot in, in our work as well in terms of like the places you grow up around have colors that you are I, that you identify with differently than you identify with other colors and um the places you go to have a palette so it's really neat that you are capturing that in such a way that like um i don't know is accurate and emotional and um i don't know it is transportative so and i just think it's really neat thanks for sharing Thanks for having me and thanks for creating a space again for me to talk about things and make things. And it was 
really, really a beautiful process to get to do this with you guys. And thank you again for the physical space of McGuffey. And I really loved being a part of it. No, oh, of course. It was our honor to, all of our residents have been such amazing people we've learned so much from and you are one of them. I mean, it's, it's been such a neat exp experience to be interacting with people like this. And um, do you have, so if anybody out there has questions, this is the time to put them in the chat box and we can um, ask Hannah those in a sec, but is there anything else that you want to add Hannah about like maybe what you're working on next or anything that you're excited about in the future or things you want people to know about mm -hmm. that are happening soon or. Um, so it's sort of complicated. I'm sort of um, switching amongst these different types of mediums and forms, um, but I specifically want to work with tables more and functional objects. And something that I'm going to do next month is um, uh, there's this person at McGuffey that owns a foundry um, and I wanted to reach out to him and recreate bricks and logs um, out of aluminum and brass and different metal forms and materials and um, have like different types of organic logs and sticks sort of be the legs of tables or be like one in the center. And uh, so that's something I wanted to work on with him. Um, and sort of create stuff with him at the foundry. But so I wanted to like expand um, the resin to metal. I can't wait to see what you make. <laughs> um, we do have a question. So Mariana Smith says, I'm curious to hear more about the resin table containing matches. Did the matches catch fire when they were immersed in the resin? What did that look like? So um, they had different volatile, volatile elements to them, but so the matches did um, kind of heat up. They didn't have the fire within the matches, but they did like create like the smoke. Um, so there was like the start of a fire with them. Um, and so the different elements had um, like this different amount of flammability to them. And so the matches were sort of, I guess I would put them in like the middle um, just because they are, are also like thick solid objects, but um, they like started the process of heating up, but didn't completely do the fire. I wanna, I'm, I'm curious, have you ever encountered a situation where it has caught on fire? Have you done a little like test, no, <laughs> no, um, I, I typically had it outside because um, I wanted like the oxygen to help it. Um, and I had it in the sun, which like had like a lot of heat. But typically um, it, it had like this weird. Uh, so the resin heats up, but it doesn't stay uh, hot. So it has um, residual heat, um, which is not it, it's great for having like smaller little fires and patches of fires, but it's not, It. what's really nice about it is it doesn't, residual heat isn't great for having like long-term volatility. Um, so it's like this nice happy medium of like, of once you start mixing the resin, it heats up and then it gets to a climax and then it sort of fizzles down um, and then becomes just solid. And so that's the curing process of resin. Um, and so there's, there's definitely some safety in just how moderate it is. I'm learning so much. Um, Connor is asking, what was the process of learning to work with and manipulating these materials? Um, so it depends because um, each table was like its own piece and different process, but Typically I worked outside in the sun and I had um, specific pieces that were, um, it, yeah, it's just really different. There was like this layering aspect to them, um, cutting of berries, but then there's, um, I worked with like compact dense things and mica and um, poetry and it, it's really different. Um, each piece had like its own challenges and, its own different materiality. So 
it's hard to say, um, like in, in general, I think. Did you learn any of these skills when you were in school or is this something that you've kind of had to teach yourself? Um, so I learned most of this when I was at Virginia Commonwealth University in the sculpture department, but the um, heating up materials and capturing smoke was this process that I had to do over time and sort of um, find out the different quirks of the materials. And so each um, over time, like I would find out more about the material and explore more. And so it was um, definitely this process of learning for the idea of creating smoke and fire, but because um, it's it's so interesting, um, all of the different elements sort of and materials work together, but they're so hard to have like a science to. Um, so it's definitely been a learning process. It seems like you went into it knowing something about the heating up. The heating up has informed the work so much too that I love that you already knew so much about this when you started to kind of approach these projects. Um, we do have another question from Mariana about, um, she says, I'm also curious, since your work focuses on volatile materials, such as the green pigment containing arsenic, did you work with volatile materials? And I guess. Um, so it's, kind of yeah i hate to say that because um in the process of making it all of these materials are kind of toxic and volatile and so there is sort of this um guilt that goes into making something that deals with toxicity because in the making you're exposing yourself to um accumulation in the bloodstream and for resin itself, um, the fumes, like I have like a mask and a respirator and goggles, but it's really bad for like jaundice and it's really bad for, um, you become allergic to resin over time, um, the more you're exposed to it, even epoxy resin. So there's this really um, precarious idea of like making with it. Um, and then also like with, I started using apple seeds and like crushing them up and there's like a small amount of um, cyanide in those. And then the marzipan has that as well. And the berries and um, I had this one piece where I like consumed flowers and pigments and it was, um, it, it's definitely like a tolling. Um, it's a very taxing process to make these objects but I feel like the process is really important to the concept. So it's a sacrifice that I think is worth it, especially because the objects are just so beautiful and I love being able to make them. That's a good question. Secrets revealed. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, does anybody else have any more questions? Last call. Sneaky last questions, no. All right. Well, thank you so much, Anna. This has been really informative. You taught me a lot about resin and other materials and history. Um, it's been really neat. Um, I wanted to say, well, yeah, thank you for your time today and for doing this with us and putting together this incredible uh, presentation. It was, it was really nice to have these visuals and to be able to read your poems as you were reading them and appreciate all of it. Um, it was such a pleasure to have you at McGuffey Art Center during your residency, and it's been a real pleasure to hear about the work you made while you were here or at McGuffey. Um, we are really excited to have been able to share this opportunity with you um, and everybody out there who isn't already following Hannah, you should go find her on Instagram. She is at the little marzipan ritual. I'm going to type that in the uh, chat box here if you aren't already, um, it's worth it. And you'll keep us posted there, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, so thank you all again for joining us here for this artist talk with Hannah. Before we close for the day, I wanna make a, just a little announcement to remind everybody to stop by the Art Center before the end of this month to see the current show. McGuffey's currently, currently has the honor of hosting during the month of February 
a show named Lay My Burdens Down, which is a full building show curated by the Charlottesville Black Arts Collective. So that'll be up through the end of next week or through the end of this week, comes down on Sunday. Um, we look forward to welcoming some new residents into the building soon for this program that Hannah was part of um, as well. So stay tuned to find out who will be in our residency space and to learn more about their work as well. And lastly, McGuffey's currently taking applications for our other year long residency program. So while our residency tends to be, you know, a shorter term residency, we have a residency program called the incubator program that runs year long residencies um, in a shared space. So if you or anyone you know would benefit from a year long residency program in a shared space, please head to our website, which is www.mcguffeyartcenter.com for more information and you'll find out about the application and everything there. And you can pass that on to any artists out there you think would benefit from that. So um, thank you all. That's all we've got. Have a great evening. Thanks. Thank you, thank Hannah. Thank you so much, Hannah. And thank you everyone for coming. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Can't wait to see what you make.